All right, shalom, and welcome back to the channel, you guys. I've got codes to talk about, and in particular, I want to talk about a, a video that I found from an author named Greg Braden. Now, uh, some of you may know him as an, as an author and as a New Age speaker from Gaia, um, but I find it very really fascinating that he did this video talking about Bible codes and I think it's a really an amazing crossover between the two niches that, that we have here, because I do see a lot of new age people that are, you know, part of our, our group um, that, that come from that. And so I wanted to share this video with you and, you know, give you some commentary on some of the things that he says and, um, you know, expand on what he says. So I think you'll find this very fascinating, very informative and, and interesting. Please watch this whole video and and be uh, be you know stay tuned for my commentary on the things that he says uh, i will be speaking afterwards and probably sharing a couple of codes during this so um be sure to watch this video it's very interesting so without further ado i want to play this and and um i'm going to play a section of it it's actually the, the first few minutes is he talks about something else and then he goes in talking about bio codes. This is very fascinating because um, this guy brings another perspective that I think is important. And so um, let me just share that with you right now. Hang tight. So if you don't know who this is, this is Greg Braden. He's the author of Wisdom Codes. Um, but in this particular video, he's going to be talking about Bible codes. Okay. And so um, let's watch this together that we always have the opportunity to change what the code is showing us. We always have a choice. We may not know that we have a choice. Really interesting We may not feel that we have a choice. But when it comes into quantum possibilities, when it comes down to quantum possibilities, <clears throat> we always have the ability to make a choice, at least enough of a choice to create a bifurcation to shift the timeline from the most frightening possibilities that we're, we're told, and we're talking about, about biblical prophecy, you know, there are a lot of very frightening. And he's right. We all, we, we all have choices in this, you guys. And I've seen this in, in the codes that a lot of times this deter, this depends on choices that we make. And I'm talking about everyone. Every one of us are encoded in these texts, you guys. And that's one thing I've been trying to convey to you over, you know, the 15 years. And by the way, I just realized that here recently that I've been doing this on YouTube for 15 years. I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have done something for 15 years unless I really, truly believed in what I do, you guys. You must understand that. And so this is why I want to share this with you. I think it's really important. Stay tuned for the rest of the video, you guys. I'm going to talk about the class that's coming up where if you want to learn how to do codes and also talk about um, uh, personal codes, looking up your name in, in the codes and things like that, because we're all there. So please watch what this guy says. Frightening possibilities uh, in the book of Revelation, for example, and in other books as well. So what I'd like to do, let's talk about the Bible code specifically, the, the Torah code, more commonly known as the Bible code. And from that, we begin to understand the science of how the queries are made and what those codes are actually saying to us. So when we talk about the Bible code, we are, in fact, talking about specifically the Torah code, the code or the codes that are embedded into those first five books of the Christian Old Testament and the Hebrew book, uh, or the Hebrew text itself that is called the Torah. The Torah is one of the most mysterious texts, uh, spiritual and religious texts that we have available to us today. Still a lot of controversy even over where it came from and how it originated. Scholars have yet to agree a hundred percent on where this text came from. There are some scholars, biblical scholars, that believe that Moses wrote the text as it was dictated to him. Others believe that Moses was handed the texts from, uh, from the experience and the event that he had on Mount Sinai when he was engulfed in the cloud and the fire, and he heard the, the name of God, and he heard the voice of God, uh, that he was actually given the Torah, 
And yet other scholars believe the Torah was an accumulation of texts that were written by humans over a period of time. As, uh, as mysterious as the origins are, what we know is that it is one of the most stable texts of the religious texts available. Uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls pushed the date of the Torah back uh, over a thousand years beyond what the original dates had believed to have been. And we now know that uh, 3,200 years BP, before present, is when the, the Torah uh, emerged, however, however that happened. Now, what makes this so interesting is when we look at copies of the Torah, modern Torahs that we have today, and we look at these ancient copies, very, very few discrepancies exist in the text. It is a very stable text. Uh, approximately 23 letters have been changed over those 3,200 years, and that is almost unheard of when you think of all the translations that's gone through uh, in different languages that it's gone through. And I just must say that that's that's in one of the texts. There's another text that, uh, and, and we've searched many of the texts. I'm currently searching the Leningrad, but in, in one of the texts, it's only nine letters. But here's the thing. It doesn't make a difference because there's some proponents of this that say that if any letter is out of place or if there's extra letters, any kind of thing like that, the code fall apart. That is not true, you guys. It's not. I've seen that it, that it's, it's, it's actually very profound. It, it reminds me like maybe like a spider web that gets damaged in one corner by some rain. The, the integrity of the, sh the structure as a whole is still there. There may be a damaged area, but for the whole, it's still there. It's not, it, it doesn't, if it doesn't cause the whole web to fall apart, if that makes any sense. This has been my experience. So I just needed to point that out. He's, he's correct in that, but there, there's other texts where it's only a difference of nine. So it doesn't matter. And e each one of those texts contain the same codes and have also different codes because of this letter difference. So it doesn't fall apart. It actually grows. True. But this is, this is the whole point. And what the, what the scholars, what the rabbis have always said about the Torah is that it is more than a book to be read, it actually is a map of time. And because they believed it was a map of time, they were very careful to duplicate every letter in a copy to be precisely what it was in the original. Before we had computers and printers, this was all done by hand. And if, if the, the rabbi, the, the scholar, would you know, be 90% into the replication of a Torah and make a mistake, uh, what they said was that that entire document had to be discarded because if it's not only that, it, it even it, further back, it was even so important to keep it right that there was, it was punishable by death. If anything, because the, the threat of the scribe changing something in, intentionally was there, they had the threat of death. So, you know, Greg's, he's right. But also um, the, the caveat, because if they did make a mistake and it was known, they would destroy the scroll. But if, if it was an intentional thing or if they suspected there were there was changes in that way, it was a death sentence. So it was very serious, you guys. And that's why we see the accuracy we see in these in these scrolls. If they changed one letter in the Torah, they would change one letter in the history or the future of the world. And I think you'll begin to understand why this is. There was a, a rabbi called the genius of Vilna. It was a uh, rabbi Elijah bin Solomon Salman. He was a Kabbalist and he summed up what I'm saying to you beautifully. What he said, and these are his words. He said, the rule is that all that was, is, and will be until the end of time is included in the Torah from the first word to the last word and not merely in the general sense, but as to the details of every species and each one individually and details of details of everything that happened to him from the day of his birth until the end. 
That's and what have you guys heard me saying about the codes this, all this time, especially when I was doing personal codes? That is very detailed, you guys. Matter of fact, I feel very inspired to do a code on Greg Braden uh, for him um, because I'm I'm using his video here as. And by the way, I'm. I, I hope he doesn't ding me for this, but I think this is very fascinating that this guy is coming to the realization of what these Hebrew codes possess. Everything that was, is, and will be, you guys have said this for years, everything that was, is, and will be, is encoded in these texts. That is why it's it's so special. It is. It's the book of life. This is why it says that it's on the front of the Bible. It says living Bible. Do you ever wonder why that is? Because everything that was, is, and will be, is in this book. This is not like the other controlled books that we've used to search codes like Moby Dick and Gone with the Wind. They don't render the codes that these this book does. Okay, so kudos to Greg Braden um, for bringing this forward. And, and so I, I appreciate that. I'm trying to I'm trying to get something worked out, you guys to where I can um, interview him or talk to him about this a little further. I just realized that he actually lives you know, less than 50 miles from me. In, in, uh, I live in, in North, Myrtle Be uh, uh, North Miami Beach in uh, Aventura, and he's just north of there. And so hopefully I can get a interview with him and talk about this a little bit further because I think these, these niche YouTube channels have – Cross pollination and have uh, significance with one another. I'm I'm one of the biggest YouTube code searchers out there, and he's here. He is talking about my, he's talking my love language right here, you guys. So please, you got to watch the rest of this video. It's very good. A direct quote. What he's saying is that the Torah is a map of all living beings, including you and me. And I'm, I'll. I'll describe how specific this is in, in just a moment. Uh, but this takes us beyond a religious document. So I'm going to invite you to consider this conversation of the Torah as a mysterious and sacred text that was left to the people of the earth to help us to understand who we are and the potentials that we have in our lives, in our future, and the role that we play in determining how those potentials play out. You can think of it that way. Uh, it takes on, for many people, it takes on a, a whole new meaning. So the Torah um, was originally received, and I, I just, I always laugh when I think of this. If you're my age or, or maybe older, uh, or maybe you've seen the reruns of the, the book, uh, the movie, uh, um, Exodus, where Charlton Heston played Moses, and indelibly engraved upon my mind is the image of Charlton Heston and his robes and his white hair and his white beard, and he's, he's staggering down from the top of Mount Sinai, and on each arm he's carrying these huge stone tablets that were given to him, the Ten Commandments uh, and the Torah on the top of Mount Sinai. That is the way we've been conditioned to think of the Torah, but modern scholars are offering us a little bit different idea. First of all, what mathematicians and what the scholars are saying is the Torah was originally received with no break in the sentences, with no punctuation. Uh, it was received in the Hebrew language, uh, which is a language that does not use vowels. So it was a, uh, a document of consonants uh, a one continuous string of 300, exactly, 304,805 characters. That number is important. So the original Torah was believed to have been received as one continuous string of information. Uh, 304,805 characters, not on a parchment, not in a book, not etched on the stone, big stone tablets, that Charlton Heston is carrying down the side of Mount Sinai. Rather, it was etched into a mysterious stone that fit in the palm of the hand. Now, we don't have any good representations of this, but if you can think, it's a very different way of thinking. If you can think of this stone 
as fitting into the, the palm of a hand. And if a high intelligence uh, truly was visiting Moses, who or whatever you believe that intelligence is, if you believe it was God, whatever you believe God to be, or if you believe it's a, a higher intelligence from a, another dimension or from another world, it would make sense that such a sacred and profound document as you're going to see would be uh, left in uh, something that would not be destroyed easily like a parchment would be. Now, in, uh, in 19, mid-1990s, 1994, a group of mathematicians under the, the guidance, the leadership of uh, Elihu Rips was the mathematician's name, published a theory uh, about the Torah. It was published in a peer-reviewed journal called Statistical Science. You can see volume nine. Uh, and here's a, a copy of the original paper, and it was under the, the title, Equidistant Letter Sequences in the Book of Genesis. By the way, you guys, this is the same rabbi who is the mathematician at Hebrew University who wrote the code program that I use. So it's the very same one. He's like one of the most top five most um, smartest people in the world. I mean, this, this guy is in to some of the most gnarly mathematics you can imagine okay so he knows what he's talking about he wrote the code program his name is Eliyahu rips okay, okay. The, the the rabbis have talked about him glazers has talked about him in their videos so um this guy knows what he's talking about now that sounds pretty benign you say well, what's that have to do with prophecy the way this works is that there is a, a, a mathematical algorithm that allows mathematicians and statisticians to search the torah for meaningful information, for patterns and sequences of words that show up beyond uh, what could be a chance, beyond what could be a fluke. And what they're saying in the abstract, it's saying it's been noted that when the book of Genesis is written as two-dimensional arrays, that equidistant letter sequences, and I'm going to share with you what that is, spelling words often appear in close proximity it says the effect is significant at the level of point zero 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 four. That means there's a very small probability that this is a fluke. One of the tests that was made was uh, a test of the names of historical rabbis. Uh, it was believed that if the Torah contained all, all that was, is, and will ever be, that the names of these rabbis should show up in the text. So a group of code specialists from the United States were invited to participate in this. These were code specialists from the intelligence agencies, NSA, CIA. And there were a, a group of historic rabbis, and they went to search for their names to see if they were in fact in the Torah. Well, not only were the names in the Torah, it was mind boggling what else was in there. The names, uh, the dates of their birth, the dates of their death, the cities that they lived in, where they- By the way, I have shown you this with the names codes that I've done for you, your personal codes, incredible detail. This is proof, you guys, that everything that was, is, and will be, is encoded there. You are there. Okay, do you understand that? I've been trying to convey this to you for 15 years. And now here I got a witness from the most, I mean, unexpected places, Greg Braden. Okay, you guys. He's speaking my lung, love language. I hope you are are getting what, what you know, the, the significance of this. The, the amount of people, okay, so to our people, who are hidden in the world are, are among his people. Do you understand that? So he's he's like a crossover for this channel. This is this is important. Practiced their uh, their tradition, the people that they practiced with. And what the experts said was our referees were baffled by this. The prior beliefs made them think that Genesis could not possibly contain meaningful references to modern day, or in this case, later day individuals, yet when the authors carried out the additional analyses and the checks, uh, the effect persisted. The paper is this offered, is thus offered to statistical science readers as a challenging puzzle. They're saying, we don't know why this is happening, but here's what's happening. 
All right, so how is it possible? How is it possible that meaningful information could be of modern day events, what we would call prophecy, could be written into a book that was delivered to the people of the earth over 3,000 years ago in a fixed format? How could that information be in there 3,000 years ago? Who 3,000 years ago knew about the events of the modern world? Well, to answer that question, we've got to unlock these codes a little bit. So I'm going to move quickly because I, I want to honor your time. And I, I just want to give you a sense for how this works. The modern Hebrew alphabet that you see on your screen is uh, inside of the red box. It, for every letter in the Hebrew alphabet, there is a mathematic code, a number associated with that letter. Now, I want you to know that this is true of every alphabet known to exist on the face of the earth today. Every ancient alphabet, whether it's cuneiform or Sumerian or Egyptian hieroglyphs or uh, kanji, uh, Japanese kanji or Chinese letters, Greek, uh, the Greek alphabet, the Phoenician alphabet, uh, the English alphabet, every alphabet has always had a mysterious number associated with it. The number is constant. It never changes. The mystery is where did the number come from? And I talk about this in other programs. I won't do it here. Uh, where do those numbers come from? But the, the fact that each letter can be converted to a number makes the computer search much easier when it comes to searching the code. And that's the point. So for the Torah code, what happens is all of those 308,000 plus letters are converted into its number equivalent. All right. So you get this long uh, sequence of continuous numbers, no punctuation, no breaks between the sentences or anything like that. All right, and then this, this information, a total of 304,805 numbers is arranged into a matrix, again, with no punctuation, no spaces, but here's the key. And if you are a mathematician, you're going to understand exactly what I'm saying here. This is not a fixed matrix of X and Y coordinates. It is a dynamic matrix that changes with the queries. Now, this gets really, really very. OK, I need to explain what he's talking about. You know how, how I've explained to you guys that um, the code is actually on. I can't even show this as a prop. Imagine a cylinder and the, these letters in one continuous stream is like a helix that goes around that cylinder for each query or each search term that we look for. The size of that cylinder is going to be different. Now, you can have queries that have the same cylinder number, but that number is going to be from two or, or one, because you can have the plain text as also as a code, but basically from two to, you know, the, the limitation of the, of the letters that are in the text. Uh, in other words, um, the, the query term or the access term is going to be limited by the number of letters that we have as a total okay so you can't there, there's a limit to the size of the cylinder for each given um search term okay so that that needs to be explained that's what he's talking about here okay so um they they vary sophisticated very interesting okay it is arranged initially into a matrix of 64 rows 4772 numbers each 64 rows, 4772. Okay, so what he's talking about here is a cylinder that's 64 rows that has 4,772 each. Okay, you can have that some that has 50 rows. You can have some that has 25 rows. You can have some that has two rows. Okay, that's the size of the matrix. And, and you've seen that in my videos in, in the different codes that I've done. Characters each. And then what happens is each time a query is made. The results of that query reposition the rest of the matrix to reflect the impact of that query. This is a dynamic matrix. This is so sophisticated. Uh, it only works with the Torah. 
uh, the researchers tried uh, popular books uh, of war and peace, big books of war and peace, Moby, uh, Moby Dick. Moby Dick, uh, Going to Win. The, the phone yeah, the, these are controlled texts. They're also called monkey texts. He's absolutely right. Back in the old days, we used to have printed telephone books. And what I'm going to share with you only works with the first five books of the Christian Bible and the, and the, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah this dynamic multi-dimensional matrix. So once this matrix, this dynamic matrix is in place, it's in the computer, then there are very complex algorithms that will search for patterns. And they will do so using what are called ELS sequences, equidistant letter search sequences or ELS algorithms. These are very, very cool. Rabbis used to do this manually, and it's said that it made them crazy. There are rabbis that literally went crazy doing this with a quill pen and, and parchment, but they knew the codes were in there before computers were ever developed. So what is an ELS code? It's also called a skip. You, you know who else did that by hand? Not only did the rabbis more than a thousand years was doing it by hand, but also Isaac Newton, you guys was also an avid code searcher. We know this because of the Cambridge papers that were produced. He wrote about it. He wrote about it. He had learned Hebrew specifically so he could search for codes in the Bible, in particular, Daniel and the book of Revelation. So not only did he learn Hebrew, but he also learned Greek. Okay, so he was searching by hand. The fact that we have the access of computers today that can do the same work in a fraction of the time is that that is like a, a privilege beyond measure, you guys, that we can do what Isaac Newton could not do. We're going to talk about that a little more here in, further in this video when I talk about the classes um, in searching codes. Code, and that's the way I'm going to refer to it. A skip code is a number that identifies how many space, how many letters you will pass over before you grab one of the letters in, uh, in the matrix. So you begin with a letter and then the skip code tells you how many letters you will go until you grab the next letter and how many letters you'll go until you grab the next letter. So for example, a skip code of 10, you would begin with the letter that you've chosen and then you would go 10 letters and grab that letter, 10 more letters and grab that letter to determine the sequence. And those letters uh, would, if it was the correct skip code, it would give you, it would reveal a meaningful message coming from uh, the biblical text. All right, so now he's going to talk about one of the most famous, the very first codes known by the rabbis were counting by hand from Genesis chapter 1, the word Torah. And they found it at a skip of 50, meaning that the cylinder that this would appear on, making the term vertical, would have been, would be 50. Okay, so you need to understand that. Next. So let me give you an example. And this is an example that rabbis have known for a long time. They, they originally discovered this manually. And it's in the book of Genesis that the, the name of the Torah is actually encoded into the book of Genesis using a skip code of 50. So remember, Genesis is the first book of the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So the way this works is the... So as you can see there, he's got Genesis in Hebrew. Bereshit, bara, Elohim, uh, uh, Elohim, et uh, hashamayim, et hasar, uh, haaretz. Um, and then in, in what you do is you start with the first tav, and you count 50, and it comes to the next letter, which is a va, right? As he says here, he's, his, his, his analysis and presentation is, is pretty spot on on this, and it, this is amazing to me. The first T, uh, so the top line that you're seeing on your screen is read from your right to your left. This is the way that, that the Hebrew is, uh, is read. There are no vowels. Specifically, there are uh, vowels that are implied. All right, so there will be no O because O is a vowel. So the first T that we see from that T, if we use a skip code of 50 and you go to the left, there's no, there, there are no other T's. And then you go to the right and you begin on the second lot level. And the, on the 50th letter, there is the O. And then you do the same thing again. You go 50 more 
and there's the R. You go 50 more, and there's the H. Remember, there is no, no O because uh, it is a vowel. So using a skip code of 50, the word Torah shows up in, uh, in the book of Genesis, early in the book of Genesis. There are very complex algorithms. And by the way, it does this, it does this more, than, more than one time. It does it twice before the book of Leviticus, and then it does it in reverse two times. At, so it skips the book of Re Leviticus, has the name yod heh vav -Heh, and then Torah spelled backwards in the other two books. So, yeah, he kind of left that off. And now he's moving into what is actually the um, keys to the Bible code program, which we'll, we, we've used in our school before as, as well as the Torah soft and, and also the um, code finder millennium edition. Now, when we start back to school, we won't be on this code program here primarily. Um, it'll be Torah soft and um, code finder, which also has the Prashita, you guys. And I, I, I want to have the students kind of tap into that because it's untouched territory, you guys. Okay. Imagine this for the most part in all these studies, we have access to the Hebrew scriptures. It was only until we got the Peshitta in the Aramaic that we were able to search that. And that has not been very long. All right. And, and the Hebrew, excuse me, the rabbis are not looking in the Peshitta. So it's left up to you, the believer who is coming out of the church experience and coming into the Hebrew walk that have access to this. So this is why it's very important to start to school back and to be searching in the Peshitta. There's still loads of codes that we need to be we we need to be finding so uh, i just need to add that caveat to this presentation that are used to do this and computer programs and right now to the best of my knowledge those programs are only working on pcs they're not made for the mac there is a way that you can we can use it on the mac you guys there's it's called a partition that you, where you can run Windows programs on the Mac. So he's he is right about that, but we can get around that. And and that's the uh, amazing thing about um, computer engineers. Uh, they made it possible to to do this. So if you have a Mac, you can also take the course and, and learn how to do the codes. Uh, you can use software on the Mac to make the Mac look like uh, a PC. And then you can run the code under that. It's a little complex to do that. But I want to give you an example. What you're seeing is a screenshot of some of those uh, search algorithms on the actual Torah code. And what you're seeing, and the, the only reason I'm, we're not going to read this, we'll, we'll read some other ones. But what I want you to see, and what I want you to see here, is that the codes can be vertical. They can go top to bottom, bottom to top, the search. It can go left to right, right to left, and it can also go diagonally. And what happens is when a meaningful letter sequence or a phrase or a word is found within a certain distance of another word, it is called statistically significant. You know, I mean, if it's, you know, like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, it probably doesn't mean much. But when these words are in close proximity or so when they're so when they're clustered together and and what he was talking about the based on the skip and the cylinder width your search terms will appear vertical okay when you're when you find your code after you found your vertical term then that's when you find you other terms that are in there that are going to be at different skips all these other terms come after the vertical term you guys that's what he's leaving out here so all of these other terms are clustering around the, the context term. So you may have something about, you know, whatever context, the presidential election, the presidential election World War III, uh, people, places, things like that. And then you will have related terms that will appear in the very same matrix window um, in a clustered area. And that is statistically an anomaly. That should not happen. And it doesn't happen in the control text like Gollum to win and, and Moby Dick and all that. It does not happen. It only happens in this in this particular book, what is called the Bible. Okay.
So um, again, very important video here. Or when they actually cross one another, and you'll see this. This is where the messages begin to appear. Now, this whole concept was, was made popular, brought to the public attention in the mid-90s. Got to stop here because this is how it all started for the code searcher. My stepfather gave me this book many years ago when I was a backslidden Christian. I wasn't even a Hebrew at that time. I didn't even know about my, my Jewish and Hebrew um, connection at that point. But I read that book. And it influenced my life because I understood I understood what it was what it was trying to convey that this this was a mathematical thing. This is not randomness. That there is something different about this text than any other book. Okay, and Michael Drazen, by the way, was a Jewish reporter from the Washington Post. He started his journey in this as a disbeliever he did not really believe in the bible codes but because he found the code of yitzhak rabin which is on the cover of this the assassination of yitzhak rabin that's what caught my attention he actually predicted the death of uh israeli um prime minister one year before it happened okay and i've had my own experiences with predictive codes so i know what i'm talking about this th th this is beyond any other book you guys this is the book of life. This is why we're all all encoded there. And every event in our life is in there. Okay. Even these kinds of things. All right. So again, very important. You got to watch this. You got to finish this, this video out. Okay. Uh, specifically, and then with a book in 97 by uh, a, a man, a journalist named Michael Drosnan. And sadly, Michael Drosnan has passed. So he is no longer involved in this, but it is through his journalism that he published this first book called The Bible Code, and I believe four, uh, four other books following uh, Bible Code 1, 2, 3, and, and 4 to bring us up to date on what was happening in the world. And the, the way that he did it was very profound because in the Bible Code, there was uh, uh, a series of sequences saying that the Israeli prime minister at the time in the 90s would be assassinated. Now, some of you I know uh, have not learned about this in school. Others of you weren't alive when this was happening. So I'll, I'll just go over this very briefly as an example. And then we'll use this example to go through other uh, queries very, very quickly once you understand how this works. So the Israeli prime minister uh, between 1983 and 1995, his name was Yitzhak Rabin. He was a man of peace, and he, if you know him, or if his name is familiar, you may remember uh, that he worked with, uh, under the, the guidance of Bill Clinton. When Bill Clinton was our president, uh, Bill Clinton was the one that got Yasser Arafat, the, uh, the Palestinian, the leader of the Palestinians on the right-hand side, and uh, Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli prime minister on the left, he got them together for the, the peace accords, they were called the, I believe is the Oslo Peace Accords, where the two men in principle agreed to create a peace. This is the closest we've ever come to peace between these two, uh, these two factions that are our brothers and sisters in blood. And, uh, and they truly are, they have the same heritage. And this is the closest we ever came. There were people that did not want that peace to happen. And one of those, uh, individuals was a man that, uh, that assassinated Yitzhak Rabin, Rabin, and he did it on November 5th, 1995. The reason I'm sharing this is because the Bible code said that when, it, when the query was made, uh, Michael Drosnan was working with the mathematicians and they saw the assassination November 5th, 1995. And they warned Yitzhak Rabin that this would happen. He listened to their warnings and he believed in the Torah code, and he said, if it's in the code, then it's meant to be, and I'm not going to change my plans. I'm paraphrasing. He went forward with uh, his day as he had planned his day, and the man that was identified in the Torah at the time of day that was identified in the Torah on the street that was identified in the Torah, uh, in fact, took the life of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. That 100% true. 
and this is this is what got me interested is because it was so accurate, you guys. And anyway, here's what's crazy: Michael Draza never found another code as accurate as that. And here's here's my my thoughts on that. I believe that the creator used Michael Drazen to bring this into the forefront of the mainstream because he never again got it and got a code as accurate as that. But he was spot on one year before it happened with with a lot of details, you guys. And I've had my own experiences, as as many of you have watched this channel uh, have seen. I was right about the, you know, the election of the Pope, that he would be a Jesuit and, and several other details about him. The only thing we didn't get was his name. Um, but once we knew his name, we found his code. We found all the details about him. You know, all uh, all the elections since Bush, we have been accurate with here. Even the, the first Trump win, the, the, the Trump loss to Biden. Accurate on both, even going against the grain on, on many people calling the other way, you guys. How did I know that? I've told you over and over again. These codes hold the everything that was, is, and will be is in these codes. I believe that with every part of my being. Why? Because I believe the creator inscribed it on stones of sapphire and gave it to, to Moses. And when he did that, something about his awesomeness and his 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 power encoded those letters with everything about creation which in my opinion proves that he is the creator there's no other answer there's no other no man cannot do this man cannot lock these things in this text 3000 years before it happens you guys there's no way okay so, so let's continue with this video. That was what brought the Bible code into the headlines. Uh, that the fact that it so accurately described this event. So what I'm sharing with you here, uh, uh, this is a highlight and I'm going to go to a computer screen. What you're seeing here is a portion of the Torah matrix. All right. Yitzhak Rabin is in the red. I just want you to see how, uh, how these codes are revealed is in the red, so you see him vertically, and crossing him, it's not even, it's nearby, it's crossing him, assassin who will assassinate actually crosses his name. Now, the bigger picture, there's a lot more information, and I want to share this with you. Here is the screenshot, and uh, they're using geometric forms to highlight the different words. So in, in the circles, the name of Yitzhak Rabin is on a diagonal, you see that. The name of the assassin who will assassinate crosses him. So it says an assassin will assassinate and it crosses his name. The assassin's name is in the, uh, the truncated pyramid in the upper left, uh, the name and his name that says his name and his name is on that same line to the right. His name is Amir. And in fact, Amir is the name of the assassin that took Yitzhak Rabin's life. So the question is, how could that information have been in a 3,000 year old text? Well, what- And we got something really similar with the Donald Trump table, you guys. Um, very similar words. Uh, the, this one says an assassin will assassinate or a killer will kill. But in the Donald Trump table, it's, it doesn't cross the, his name. His name is vertical and, and right next to the name, it says a killer uh, uh, excuse me, the name of the killer, implying that there, there's a name involved um, yeah. in in that anomaly there. Um, the fact that this happened and that we, we also found something very similar with Donald Trump indicates that there's a high probability mathematically and statistically that something will happen, okay? And this is why this is all important. What the, the scientists did they said, what if Yitzhak Rabin had postponed his tour that day? He was on a, uh, he was doing a, essentially a parade. What if he'd postponed that parade? So they entered the query into the Bible code and it still said name of assassin who will assassinate. Name of the assassin was Amir Yitzhak Rabin. But then it says assassination delayed. So if Yitzhak Rabin had postponed, he would have lived that day 
perhaps uh, not on uh, to another day because it said assassination was delayed. So these are the kinds of things that are showing up. And then the scholars began to go back and look in history and see what else could possibly be in this Bible code, in this Torah code. And the answer is everything, everything. Any, any event that you put in there is going to show up. These are major events. Here you see the, the atomic holocaust in Hiroshima and the circles vertically, you see atomic holocaust. The triangles, you see Japan, the years in the squares crosses the atomic holocaust. It is the Hebrew year 5705, which translates into the Julian year or the Christian year 1945. So 1945 actually crosses, and this is the only place this happens in the Bible code. There is nowhere, when all the queries are run, there is nowhere that says that this will happen as it did. During the Cold War years, there was a, a potential in the mid-1980s and all the queries have been run since that time. Nowhere does it say nuclear holocaust, atomic holocaust. So I'm saying this because many people are concerned that we're going to have an all-out global war with... Okay, now this got to be said. Based off of the last video that you saw me do, do, you guys, on the atomic holocaust and the threat of the United States being attacked, uh, this is the one place in this video where I, I would disagree with Greg on this. And, and it's because we found more codes and not just me, other, you know, rabbis have also looked at these codes. Michael Drazen also being one of them because he found the original here, Atomic Holocaust. But we, all, we also expanded on that and found that there's a high probability of uh, something like this happening in the future. And we know from Bible prophecy that it is actually prophesied. So I just got to add that to this. Mushroom clouds on every horizon. And I'm not saying that we couldn't have a limit. And now this is what's really interesting that he says this, because in my video, I told you that the strikes that we, we shouldn't e expect because of midah kenegah midah, measure for measure in Hebrew, right? Which means um, we can expect what we did to others. We dropped two nuclear bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II, right? Americans ex can expect the same thing, but with the added effect of iniquity, which is punished by seven times. What is iniquity? Well, you know, the intentional sin and something done maliciously, that things like that. But but the seven, there are seven things that, that Yah hates. One is the shedding of innocent blood. We did that in Japan. No doubt about it. That is going to come back on us as a nation. And, and what the, the, the Spirit has shown me is this is going to happen on both coasts, but in limited yields. Why? Because they don't want total devastation. They just want to, to neutralize the enemy, which would be us and our government. But they don't want to destroy the interior. They don't want to de de destroy the... Um, you know, the, the infrastructure, for instance, the Gulf Coast and, and the port of, of New Orleans and the port of Long Beach, these things have to be intact to, to export the natural resources out of the country. Okay, so low yield tax on the East and West Coast. And by the way, I'm going to show you a code here in just a minute that I've, I've got on Iran and, and this very thing I, I found several years ago that is relevant right now, you guys. So, um, again, I love Greg Braden, but I disagree on this point. I think it is highly probable that we can see this in the future. And I hate to say that. I, I don't even, I don't want to even be, want to spread that kind of things, but it's very dangerous right now, you guys. It is very prophetic, biblically. Limited nuclear exchange. I hope not. Um, I hope and I believe that cooler heads will prevail. But if that happened, that is not an all-out holocaust. That would be uh, a, a limited, it's called the tac tactical nuclear exchange. It's a horrible, it's a horrible term that has been coined in military circles. There are what are called tactical nuclear weapons designed to be used on the battlefield uh, much smaller in scale than what happened in, in Hiroshima. Uh, very sad uh, that anyone would even put the time and energy into developing a weapon like that called a tactical nuke. So.
Okay, you guys, let me just bring up the code that I was just talking about. I'm sorry about that um, transition there. Um, but I want you to see this. Uh, and, and this is just one of, of the codes that I found, which is war, and it has a date there. The days of Noah, very vertical, right next to it. His word. Why? Because it says that. United States is involvement there. China, Korea, Russia, Iran, all of the elements are here in this. Same, same kind of thing with war in the plain text. Attacked. Korea at the top, days of Noah, days of Noah in the plain text. So all of these elements are here in, in other codes that indicate that this is a very real possibility. my science. So this is this is how this works. And they began looking at other things. John F. Kennedy, the assassination of President John Kennedy. Here his name is in circles uh, vertically. Uh, to die is actually in the same circle. The city of Dallas where he was assassinated is in there. Uh, and it goes on in more detail in other codes. It tells the name of the assassin, the street, the time of day, how it happened. Here it is uh, name of the assassin is Oswald. You're seeing in the diag. I forgot that I put this in there. Uh, Oswald is uh, in the, the circles. He was a marksman. You see that in the, the diamonds. Name of the assassin who will assassinate. Very similar to what you saw with Yitzhak Rabin. 9-11, uh, before it happened. And this is, this is really amazing. Here you see the twin towers vertically in the center in the circles. It knocked down in a truncated, uh, it's almost like a trapezoid that you see twice, it happened two times, airplane is in there. And in a more detailed, uh, more detailed query, you actually see the name of bin Laden is in the green on the right-hand side of, of the code there. Uh, attack, thousands die. So you get the sense for how this works. It, not only bad things, a lot of good things. The uh, Torah codes described Obama's election. Here they say Barack Obama. Uh, the, they give his name. His name is spelled out in blue in Hebrew. Uh, he's president, and you see. And you guys, you've you've seen this from me. I, I've worked this code many times, and and one of the hidden gems of this, as you, as you can see here, um, Barack, in the in the Bet Resh Kuf, is his name, but also the letters in between spell out Barry, and so you got both first names right here with Obama and. The blue. So this is a very profound code. We found, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of details in this code here. This, this, listen, I was able to predict both presidential elections because of this code right here. I also knew that he was an he was a uh, a Muslim because both spelling of of Muslim is in this code. Um, one is here and one is up at the top here. So. Um, or Islamic, uh, as you can see, the Islamic, um, he's, anyway, this is a very famous code, and I just had to point that out. I hadn't seen this in years, by the way. See that in the Pentagon's, uh, Barack, his name is on there. Islamic affiliations, his name is on, is in there. In the USA, is all in there, okay? So I'm going to make a point here because the Bible code doesn't predict, and I want to be really clear, and I'll, you'll hear me say this again. It doesn't predict if you know what to ask. That is very true. It does not predict, you guys, because you have this X factor, which is called man's free will, and you have choices. So there are po there are possibilities. And, and the trick to this, if there is a trick, is called probability, which is more probable, Okay. And so you have to kind of get in the mind of people to understand their choices and what, what kind of choices they're going to make. Um, for instance, Biden or, you know, um, Trump, things like that, um, to make these predictions. What is probable? What is not probable? Okay. And so that that's there, there's this X factor um, 
or X variable that is involved, the unknown. There is, a, there is always an unknown variable to any one of these codes, okay? Um, you cannot predict the future, but you can be led to prophetic or, or futuristic events by the Ruach. This is one of the reasons how we know this is of him, because he is the only one who knows the beginning from the end and the end from, the, from to the beginning, okay? And so he's the only one that can reveal these things. It was not Jonathan and his intellect, and he, he's so smart, and he figured out that Biden was going to be president. No, it was the Holy Spirit that led me to that. It led me to that code, and I made an, uh, an you know, and I just made an analysis of it. It is what it is. <laughs> and so I think this is, you know, um, what Daniel is referring to when he talks about in Daniel 12, verse 4, about sealing the books until the end. And, and, and you know, when knowledge is increased, man is running to and fro. These things are going to be revealed to us. This is what he's talking about in these things here. And I think Greg even mentions that in a moment or, or, or makes reference to that um, vaguely in, in just a moment. It will reveal the relationships, but it is not predicting what will happen. So when the queries were made in hindsight, it was easy to, to choose the words and the keywords. It's, it's kind of like a search algorithm in Google. You know that uh, you get pretty good at refining the kinds of, of keywords to help you better find what you're looking for in Google. In this software, the, the way that the, the queries are entered uh, in hindsight can help us to know what the, the code knew about all of this. But the thing is, you have to ask the question. It's not predicting blanket, you know, these things are going to happen. You've got to know what question to ask, number one. Number two, the query must be made in the Hebrew language because it is being queried against the Torah. Now, there are ways to translate English into Hebrew so that you can make the query into Hebrew. But the algorithm has to have a query in, in the Hebrew language. Now, the reason I'm, I'm going through all of this is the point I'm going to make right here. Because the Bible code always tells us that we always have a choice. Our fate is never sealed unless we choose to seal our fate. We are never destined to a dark outcome unless we choose that outcome because any choice that we make prior to that outcome creates the bifurcation that takes us onto a different path, onto a different timeline, thus avoiding those outcomes. Here's a perfect example of what I'm going to say here. In the year 2000, there was a threat of a nuclear annihilation for Israel. It's being made by some of Israel's enemies. So the, the Hebrew year 5760, the uh, Julian year 2000, Holocaust of Israel, it says it was delayed. Look at this. In the year 1996, the same thing. It says, will you change it? Right there. And I highlighted this in red. And you will find this frequently in the Torah codes in a, a place near the most frightening, the most frightening statements that are in there. Uh, nuclear Holocaust. Uh, Atomic, atomic Holocaust, for example, like you're seeing here. Will you change it? The code itself is telling us that we always have a choice. The key is we must act upon our choice. We must make the choice of peace. We must make the choice to avoid the darkest scenarios that uh, are, are depicted in these codes. And that is true of any prophecy. The Hopi prophecy tells the same thing. The Incan prophecy tells us the same thing. Tibetan prophecies tell us the same thing. All they can tell us is what may happen if nothing changes. They're looking at probabilities in time and space. As we embrace our power, our power to choose, our power to influence these quantum realities. By doing that as individuals and by doing it collectively, we are shifting those timelines to avoid those darkest, those darkest moments. And as I said, 
unless something has changed, all of the Torah codes that from the, the experts that I've seen, that I've worked with, and I've been a student of this, I've studied this since the 90s myself. We've done whole workshops on this. I do not see anything in there about a nuclear holocaust or atomic holocaust beyond uh, the end of the Cold War. So of all the things you have to worry about, and there are a lot of things out there, maybe that one can have a little less priority for you. Again, respectively, respectively, I, 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 I must disagree here. And I do that with utmost respect to this guy. I, I respect that his his research. I don't doubt that he's he's convinced of what he's saying here, because I've looked at this for fifteen years, and for the last eight years at least, the codes have been showing me this war that is going to build up. Now, if you recall, I mentioned in my last video my analysis of of the codes and the the signs in the heavens. I'm I'm shooting 50% on that. Okay. There's only one other variable. And, and we can look around the world and see that is setting up just like World War One. It's 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 very similar. Okay. So and and listen, I don't wish that to happen. I don't want to see that happen. But but it you know, it is what it is. It is what I see there. And I'm not the only one, by the way, that, that have seen this. And there's others who have, have, are not involved in the codes at all and that has visions of those kind of things. I'm just saying the codes are confirming just the opposite. Okay? Keep that in mind. I want you to know that you're in the Torah code because everyone is. Every name of every person that's ever been entered is in the Torah code. The city that you're born, by the way, this where is you live your life. Uh, who who your partners are in life, it's all in there. And you say, how can that be? How can that possibly be? And the answer to that, it's a deep mystery. It goes back to what Einstein said uh, early on, is that the past, present, and future all exist simultaneously. You are there, you guys. Everyone is there. So somehow, and by the way, we're going to we're going to go. And this is the way, as a scientist, I choose to think of this. We're going to continue You've seen me talk in past pro searching names codes, you guys. Um, he's right about that. Everybody's name is in there. OK, so th this is a I, I discovered from searching you guys out was a great way of blessing um, to you guys. This this is an amazing thing to see. And it really kind of brings it home for everyone. programs about the very real possibility that we are living in a simulated reality or a virtual reality, that we are living a simulation, learning something about ourselves, learning about the power of love, learning about the power of human emotion, learning about the power of good and evil. And I say that because those are the dominant themes playing out in our world. The ancient theme of good and evil has been playing out since the beginning. The power of love to transcend hate and to transcend our hurt and heal and the power of human emotion to elicit that love. Those are all factors uh, that I personally believe are, are dominant factors. If we're learning anything in uh, a simulated world, I believe this is what we're learning. Now, the Bible code itself says that the code cannot be understood until what is called the end of time, not the end of the world, not the end of the world like so many people thought 2012 was. 2012 wasn't the end of the world. We're not living the end of the world now. We may be living the end of a certain kind of time and moving into a, a different kind of time. He's right about that. In 2012, it was not the end of the world, you guys. We moved into what is called the time of sorrows. Um, it, it's, you know, there, there are these transition periods and it's broke up into seven and into three and a half. Okay. And there, there was a point called the time of sorrows. Then we go into what's called Jacob's trouble. It is the birth pains of the woman in travail. It is a progressive thing. It gets more intense toward the end. This is according to in, uh, what the Bible prophecies say, you guys. It gets darker before the dawn. All right time, a new kind of time.
what the Bible code says very clearly is that we will only be able to read the code in the at the end of time when computers and the word computer is in Daniel 12 verse 4 and this is um I think what he's re referring to here uh, but you, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book until the end time of the end. Many shall dil diligent search and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, look and saw two others standing, one on the bank and one on the river of the bank. And one of the men, and by the man, this this man dressed in linen, I believe, is the is the one called Enoch. Um, he is seeing basically um, the what, what is to happen in the end. The an the angel tells him. That, that he is to go for the words are hidden and sealed until the time of the end, right? Many shall be cleansed and made white, refined, but the wrong shall be wrong and none of the wrong shall understand, but those who have insight shall understand, right? And then he tells, you know, he, he says something really interesting to Daniel, um, which is, you know, go your way and, and rest, and rise at your lot at the end of the day. So he's basically tell Daniel, just, you know, when you pass away, just don't worry about it. You'll rise to, to your lot at the end of the days, and you'll see the outcome of that, right? Daniel was, if you recall, Daniel was very burdened. As you see, I think it's in chapter 10 where he gets very sick um, because of Yahuwah shows him what is to come. He gets sick physically. And uh, the angel has to revive him. It's because of what he was shown. Imagine that he's a person from the ancient times. He's shown something thousands of years in the future. You, you know, it's just the sight of that is probably going to make you nauseous to see the movement of cars and to, of whatever he saw. You know, it made him physically sick. And he had to be revived. So here the angel's telling him, don't, you know, just go your way. Don't and rest. Don't worry about it, um, Daniel. And arise to your lot in the end of days, right? So Daniel, by the way, Daniel plays a big part. This is the one of the books that Isaac Newton studied when he learned Hebrew was the book of Daniel. And again, the book of Revelation. Both books are highly encoded and speak of the end times. And uh, that's why this is important. Um, by the way, um, there are many codes there that, that have been found in the book of Daniel. And, um, you know, there's only just a little bit left of the Greg Braden video here, you guys. Um, I want you to go and watch it on his channel so he, he doesn't get mad at me. I'm, I'm not, you know, ripping his material. I just, I wanted to kind of walk through it with you because I think it's a fascinating perspective that this guy brings to it. And he brings it, he brings a level of credibility and this is not so kooky, you, you know, right? Because, um, <laughs> you know, I look like a crazy person telling people that there are codes in the Bible that, that are profound, right? So if, when I see somebody of this caliber speaking my love language, I'm kind of drawn to that. And so I want, I want to integrate that. And by the way, Greg, if you're watching this, I, I would really like to get with you and talk to you about some of these codes. I found thousands and thousands of code. I have trained. I've had over 500 students in my course, take my course. Um, and I've been doing this for 15 years. So, um, I, I have I've been around the block with the codes and I'm I'm convinced. And so I was very fascinated to see your your presentation here. And that's why I integrated it into my channel into this. And so um yeah. Uh again, let you know I'm not gonna play the rest of of that. He he's he's gone into a lot of detail already. Please go and watch the the, the whole video at his channel so he gets the views this is not me about me getting views this is about me being excited about bible codes and um you know I, i'm i'm, I'm kind of in, in a better place right now in my life you guys where I, i'm feeling um like i want to teach again and i want to um get back into showing you how you guys how to do this and so uh we're going to be talking about that here very soon about how uh, you can learn how to do this. It's not very hard. It's learning some basic Hebrew and learning a code program. And the rest is the Holy Spirit. It's not about intellect. It's not about how smart you are. 
um, it's because I'm not a smart person, you guys. Okay, I'm not some some Hebrew genius or anything. I'm just some some regular schmo that the Holy Spirit got a hold of and 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 gave me a passion. Okay, so you can do this as well. And by the way, your name is there. We're also going to continue doing that, um, searching people's names and showing them in the codes, and um, you know, giving them something to 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 chew on. Uh, it's it's actually a, a pretty cool blessing to see a code with your name and all your details in there and, and have a feeling of inclusion because it, it, people tend to have this belief that God has forgotten them and they're not important in, when you are. He knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about you. And so he has you encoded in his book. And so it's been a privilege of mine to be able to show that to people in, in past experiences. So we're going to get back to that here very soon um, and uh, be back to work, you guys. Uh, quite frankly, I need it. Um, I'm here on the island and uh, I need work. I have no income and I have to survive here for probably a few months. Okay, I'm, you know, and rent's expensive here. Um, if you're watching this and you care about this channel and you care about codes and, and, um, and you're interested in helping me, you can... A, you can take the course that I offer, or B, you can help with a donation. Um, I would welcome either one of those. Or you can have a names code done for a donation, and that would help them the cause out as well. I have to survive. Um, and that brings anxiety to me because uh, I haven't had, uh, you know, a school in the past year, over a year, almost two years now. And so I've had to depend on others to help me. And and so it's a, it's a point of stress to me right now. And I don't need that going into this season where, I, you know, I'm having to defend myself and, and things like that. So please consider a donation and helping me or um, contracting me in searching a name or, or taking the course. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave you with um, the end of this video. Shalom to you. May you who bless you. Please continue to pray for this ministry and for me. And uh, we will see you in the next video. Shalom.